Hello everybody. Once again, welcome back to our weekly teachings, the books of the Bible. Now this week we're going into the books of Acts part 1 and many of us are familiar with the book of Acts. But I will go on to say that as we prepare our hearts to receive, may the Spirit of God enlighten us and quicken us. So we are being mindful, the word is say that God is able to do all things, everything. And the word of God is to bring healing and deliverance in our lives. So we too would be able to stand and help to encourage those that are in need. Be blessed and receptive as we open up in the book of Acts teachings, part one. The Acts of the Apostles or the book of Acts, is the fifth book of the New Testament. It tells of the founding of the Christian Church and the spread of its message to the Roman Empire. Both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are addressed to a man named Theophilus and have been accepted as written by the same author. While the author is not named in either volume, according to church tradition, the author was the Luke, named as a companion of the Apostle Paul in three of the letters attributed to Paul himself. The title Acts of the Apostles was first used by Arrhenius in the late second century. As we have seen in the first part, the Gospel of Luke tells how God fulfilled his plan for the world's salvation through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the promised Messiah. The book of Acts continues the story of Christianity in the first century, beginning with the ascension of Jesus to heaven. The early chapters set in Jerusalem describe the day of Pentecost, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the growth of the church in Jerusalem. Initially the Jews are receptive to the Christian message, but later they turn against the followers of Jesus. Rejected by the Jews, the message is taken to the Gentiles under the guidance of Paul the Apostle. The later chapters tell of Paul's conversion, his mission in Asia Minor and the Aegean, and finally his imprisonment in Rome, where, as the book ends, he awaits trial. The earliest possible date for Luke Acts is around 62 AD, the time of Paul's imprisonment in Rome. Many scholars date the work to between 80 and 90 AD, although the book does not mention the deaths of Peter and Paul, nor the destruction of the temple ending where Paul is still awaiting trial in Rome. The books of Luke and Acts give a full account of the beginnings of Christianity, the former treatise being the book of Luke on the life of Christ, and the latter being the account in the book of Acts about the outpouring of the Spirit at Jerusalem at Pentecost and the subsequent development of the early church. Acts selectively covers the first 30 years of the church's history. Luke traces the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. Luke continues to be shown to be accurate in his depiction of countries, cities, people and officials. Acts forms an important bridge between the Gospels and the Pauline epistles. Luke shows in Acts that the Gospel moved from the confines of Judaism into the Gentile world in spite of opposition and persecution. He also reveals the role of the Holy Spirit in the Church's life and mission. Acts describes what Jesus continued to do and teach after his ascension by the power of the Holy Spirit, working in and through the disciples in the early Church. Chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is a key verse providing the geographical and theological summary of the book. The structure of the book of Acts is basically three sections. Chapters uh, 1 to 7 deal with Peter, 8 to 12 with the Apostle Philip, and 13 to 28 with Paul. And those uh, break down to the foundation of the church between chapters 1 and 12, and the founder of the church is between 13 and 28, and the mission to the Jews in chapters 1 through 7, the mission to the Samaritans through 8 through 12, and to the Gentiles through 13 to 28. And that uh, fulfills the um, mandate we were just looking at in Acts 1 8, first to Jerusalem, and then to Judea and Samaria, and then to the rest of the world. We see nine features of the book of Acts. 1. The true nature of the mission of the church and the source of its power. 2. The role of the Holy Spirit. 3. The early church messages by Peter, Stephen, Paul and James. 4. We see regular and fervent prayer. 5. We see signs, wonders and miracles. 6. We see persecution. Proclaiming the gospel with power brings opposition. And in the 7th we see a Jew-Gentile sequence. First to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. 8. We see the role of the women in the early church. And 9. We see triumph. No barriers could thwart the advance of the gospel. And so when we start with chapter 1, as we mentioned, it's the bridge from the Gospel of Luke, and then it goes on to the prophecy of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 1 verse 1 begins, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day he was taken up to heaven, 
After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of forty days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The apostles returned to Jerusalem, and after prayers, selected Matthias to replace Judas. The criteria being that he was a man who has been with the disciples the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. In chapter 2, you see that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servant, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and the glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourself know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan, and for knowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriot David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne, saying what was to come. He spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body seek decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool 
for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucify, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from him. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. A crowd came to Peter and John after the beggar was healed, and Peter spoke to them, recounting the events of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, and then going on, Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he has foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, then turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each one of you from your wicked ways. Peter and John were arrested for preaching about Jesus and his resurrection and put in jail till the next day. But about 2,000 were added to their number. The high priest then has Peter and John brought before the leaders and asked, By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The leaders were not sure what to do. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them, because all the people were praising God for what had happened. But the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. 
On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and prayed. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, what is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me. Is this the price you and your Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the man who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who had heard about these events. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. The guards found the jail empty and reported to the high priest and the officials. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. The number of disciples is increasing rapidly. So the disciples appoint seven people to wait on tables and distribute food while they focus on prayer and the ministry of the word. Among the seven is Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, doing great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. 
Opposition arose to Stephen, and the plotters persuaded some men to say they had heard Stephen blaspheme against Moses and God. Stephen is arrested and taken for their Sanhedrin. When asked if the charges against him were true, Stephen recounts the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph and Moses and finishes, You stiff-necked people, your hearts and your ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have been betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given to angels but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look! He said, I see heaven open and a son of man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this he fell asleep. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Simon a sorcerer heard Philip and believed and was baptized. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry, because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord, in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasure of the Kandaki, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Then Philip explained the scripture and the good news about Jesus to him. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, and travelled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns, until he reached Caesarea. In chapter 9, we see that meanwhile Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. 
So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he had seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Meanwhile, Peter heals Ananias, a paralytic in Lydia, resulting in more believers, and then goes to Joppa where he raises a disciple, Dorcas, from the dead. Again, many people believed in the Lord as a result of this miracle. In chapter 10, we see that at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon at Tana whose house is by the sea. About noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up onto the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meat was being prepared he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped by the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We've come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware 
that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who was Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God has already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. But Peter's called to explain his actions to the circumcised believers at Jerusalem. Peter recounts what happened with Cornelius. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift, he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. The persecution led to the believers traveling abroad and telling their good news about Jesus. A great number in Antioch believed, and Barnabas brought souls from Tarsus to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. In chapter 12, we see that it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. An angel rescues Peter, and he goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many people had gathered and prayed. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. Herod, discovering Peter gone, had the guards executed. Herod is then struck down and then dies after accepting praise as a god. In the church at Antioch, after they had fasted and prayed, the believers placed their hands on Barnabas and Saul and sent them off. They stop at Cyprus where Paul speaks against a sorcerer. The sorcerer is blinded. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. At Perga, John Mark leaves them to return to Jerusalem. Paul speaks to the synagogue leaders about the good news about Jesus. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, 
the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourself worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. In chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas go to Iconium with Jews and Gentiles believing. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles against Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas learn of the plot and flee to Lystra and Derbe. Then Paul heals a crippled man and they're hailed as gods. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothing and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your heart with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him out the side of the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the gospel in that city, Derby, and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Alistra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraged them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, in whom they put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From Italia they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. Our first part of exploring the book of Acts, from chapters 1 through 14, focuses on the apostles' recovery after the resurrection, and the establishment of the church against opposition from the Jewish leaders and coming to terms with the gospel message being available to the Gentiles. Acts tells of the coming and ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who empowered the church and empowers us today. The church today needs the Holy Spirit just as much as the early church. The goal of the Holy Spirit is to draw people to God the Father through Jesus Christ his Son. If you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you to him, then pray this prayer now with us to join the kingdom of God. Shall we pray? Dear God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I acknowledge to you that I am a sinner, and I am sorry for my sins and the life that I have lived. I need your forgiveness. I believe that your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, shed his precious blood on the cross at Calvary and died for my sins. And I am now willing to turn from my sin. You said in the Bible that if we confess the Lord our God and believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. Right now, I confess Jesus as my Lord. With my heart, I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. This very moment I accept Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior, and according to his word right now, I am saved. Amen. Amen. And now Amen. if you prayed that prayer, then that's just the beginning of your journey into the kingdom of God. You need to find yourself a good Bible to read and study, find a good church to become part of, a church that believes in the ongoing uh, ever-present active work of the Holy Spirit even today, and uh, gather yourself with fellow believers who will help to encourage and edify you, just as in your turn you can help and encourage and edify them as you go through facing the challenges of life. Because it is a, uh, a journey that uh, uh, we need to have faith in because things will happen to us. Being a Christian is not a life uh, without difficulty, but it's knowing that when we do run into difficulties, the Lord Jesus Christ is with us 
to carry us through those difficulties. So we just thank God for you now for all of those who have prayed that prayer and we welcome you into the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Again, I give God thanks after going to the teachings of the first part of the book of Acts. Here we see the fulfillment, the promises that God had spoken forth uh, when Jesus ministered on the earth, but it was also a promise that was manifested for the glory of God after Jesus um, had given his life and died on a cross, resurrection. And the promise was the gift of the Holy Spirit. And God's word reminds us is, it's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit, all things are possible. And we are also mindful that one sin that God will not forgive is grieving the Holy Spirit. Here we are today, as we are called to minister and to do things that is right, not only in our daily lives, in our families, in our homes, but wherever we are positioned, we are called to give an account, whether good or bad. When God's desire for, his, for us to be blessed, He desires for us to prosper, but prosper not just for our personal desires. Prosper where the blessings are multiplied throughout the earth. As we go about our daily lives, always remember, whatever is done in secret, God himself will bring it to light. And always remember that whatever we do and say, let it be for the glory of God and knowing that God is the one that has provided everything for us to be able to accomplish and to fulfill every assignment that he makes possible for us. I pray that as you went into the receptors of the teachings of the first part of Acts, that be mindful that God is an all-seeing God and he hears everything. And he wants us to know that his spirit, the Holy Spirit himself, is the one who will always enable us to continue to endure and to persevere into the things that he purposed for us to accomplish. And we thank God for Jesus Christ, who is an example of us fulfilling God's will and not our will. And there's only a time and a season we are called to do it. So let's continue to be faithful, fulfilling our calling, even in our natural strength, in our weakness. God is strong. And we thank God for healing and deliverance, but most of all to restore us and to position us where we should be, to truly be the vessel that he has called us to be, fulfilling greatness and the goodness of him. So I bless and praise your holy name. Amen. Amen.